Greetings, Professor Falcon. Shall we play a game? How about global thermonuclear war? Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going back even further than that to take a look at the computer from the movie War Games. Now, your first thought might be the Whopper, the machine behind the scenes that ran NORAD and then went completely palm far from playing too much tic-tac-toe with itself. But that machine was fictional, of course. The real star of the movie was the MSI 8080 that David Lightman used to connect to and speak on behalf of the Whopper. We'll take a look at the brand new one I just bought that even connected to the web and surf it a little just to prove it can be done today. We'll also get it running Zork as well as the original Microsoft Basic and I'll show you how to key in data via those mysterious front panel switches and blinking lights that make it so awesome to look at. Now before I proceed though, if you're a subscriber I have a favor to ask. Please check to ensure that you are in fact still subscribed as apparently there was a bit of a purge recently. Subscriptions these days don't really accomplish much except making me feel better unless you turn on personal recommendations via that bell icon, so I have to encourage you to do that as well so you don't miss any episodes. Back to the old computers though. As you'll soon discover, the MSI 8080 is surprisingly close to the Altair 8800, and that's not entirely coincidental. The MSI is effectively the world's first clone computer, a functional duplicate of the Altair. It even uses the exact same S100 bus or backplane and cards from one can be used directly in the other. Now the MSI wasn't a clone of the Altair with a simple intention just to whip it off, however. You see, a fellow named William Millard was trying to build business systems and he reportedly couldn't secure a regular supply of the Altairs with which to do it. It all came about out of a desire to build a system that could then be sold to General Motors car dealerships. They planned to have a terminal, a printer, special software tailored to the dealerships, and up to five such systems could be clustered around a central server with a hard disk. That was big stuff for 1974, and their first abortive attempts based on the Intel 4004 chip didn't get very far. Then, their chief engineer, Joe Killian, turned to the microprocessor in the form of the newly available Intel 8080. They had hoped to use off-the-shelf Altairs, as I said, as the basis of their system, but when they could not secure a reliable supply of the machines, they decided to vertically integrate by building their own machine around that same S100 bus. The first ads for the IMSI appeared in the October 1975 issue of Popular Electronics. They shipped the first kits that December before ultimately turning production to fully assembled units shortly thereafter. In 1977, IMSI paid Gary Kildall $25,000 for the rights to CPM, a move that helped CPM establish a foothold amongst early personal computers. By 1979, IMSI had produced an all-in-one computer called the VDP, but it just wasn't competitive with the new TRS-80, Commodore PET, and Apple II. And as a result, IMSI was bankrupt before the decade was out, and that's the end of the short life of the IMSI company. The IMSI system itself was a handsome machine, complete with a full set of toggle switches and LEDs reminiscent of the PDP-8 and PDP-11 front panels. If you had the money, there was also a dual floppy drive and a controller available, as well as other peripherals like modems and CRTs to round out your system. Now, the one I just purchased from thehighnibble.com is an imposter of sorts, because it's a replica. It's a very convincing replica, though, and it operates exactly as did the original. Now, as impressive as the aesthetics are, the software inside is even more so. The authors have not only provided complete 8080 emulation on the ESP32, but... They've also added a web UI that allows you to easily manage the system, including mounting and ejecting disk images through a simple drag and drop mechanism. Pretty cool stuff when you consider that the ESP32 can be had for about $3. The kit itself costs about $280 US, plus about half as much again to ship it insured from Australia. I bought and paid for my own kit, but a viewer named Neil graciously volunteered to assemble it for me. Now, Neil's a skilled tech, and I'm busy making these episodes, plus I've got a PDP-11 front panel replica already in the queue to do first, so he was really a lifesaver on this one. He did a great job, and you should check out his retro tech channel called the Shadowtron Blog. I'll also put the link in the video description. And now, let's dive right on in, figure out that front panel, and get some code running on the MSI. Okay, I'll give you a little introduction on how to use the front panel to set, inspect, and code in actual data into memory. The easiest way to do it is to press reset, which will get you down to address zero. We'll set all of our address toggles down, which means we're going to address zero as well. So when I say examine, I see what's in the contents of address zero. 
Now this is ROM, so if I say examine next, I will be stepping through, and there's the various values of ROM as the address increases. Now if I want to go to an area of RAM and just edit something, or maybe enter a short program, I know there's RAM with all four bits high in the address. If I say examine, I'll see it's zeros. I can step through here, and there's just kind of random data in here. Similarly, if I want to store the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in memory, I could go down to memory, the base memory here, the 4 bits, and then everything else zeros, and I'll store 0 in this location. And 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6, and 7. Now if I start back down at the base address of 0 here, I should see that it's 0 and stored in 0 address. Now address 1 should have 1 in it, address 2 should have 2 in it, and so on. And as we step through, that's what we stored there. So that's your basic mechanism for entering, well, these could be opcodes, could be data, whatever you need. This is an output register, so you can see your results if you need to store them on the front panel. And this indicates the status bits of the CPU all packed into the status byte. Now when I hit run, it will go to the current address and start. Now this is just garbage, so that would crash it. But if I say reset to go back to address 0 and run, now we should be running. But what are we running? Well, it depends how we have the system configured. If I have it set up to boot into MS Basic, it will do that. If I set it up to boot into CPM, that's where it'll go. And that's done by configuring the non-volatile storage. Examine up. Reset. There we go. This little stepping LED indicates we're in configuration mode. We can see my current configuration bits are set to this. Bit 3 is my Wi-Fi station access, so I'm going to leave that on. Of course, this only applies to the replica. The original did not have Wi-Fi. So this configuration bit, I should stress, is actually for the replica and telling the replica which ROMs to build in so it knows what to boot. Examine up. Reset. Examine down. Now that's why we want these bits off. And we want a single bit on. Now I am going to add one bit here, which is my Wi-Fi bit. And that indicates that I want the Wi-Fi to operate in station mode on the replica. Now I should just deposit this. And when I reboot it, it should come up in MS Basic. Turn it on. Let it run. It seems to be operating. Let's go see what we've got on the prompt. And as soon as it comes up, we've got question marks. I'll do new to clear memory, and we'll type in a really simple basic program that prints hello with a comma so it stays on the same line. 20, go to 10. We'll run it, and there you go. A whole bunch of hellos. Sure enough, basic works. Now let's see if we can get it to boot into CPM. Set examine. Do my reset. Wait for this mode. We'll see these are the current bits that I've set. What we want now. And bit 3. So this should indicate the boot ROMs for CPM, the CPU mode, and then Wi-Fi station mode again. And when I say deposit, I should have stored it. I can then reboot, power on, hit run. It seems to be operating. And sure enough, we're at the CPM prompt. So it's much like a very, very rudimentary MS-DOS. If I do a directory, I can see I have a number of commands in here. I can run CLS, for example. There's the screen. If I go to drive B, I'll see that I have a number of communications programs. We'll come back to those in a moment. But for now, we'll take a look at drive C, which you would think would be a hard drive in MS-DOS land, but if you have multiple floppies, then the third floppy is drive C. And this machine is set up with four images. Now here's Zork 1. There you go. Ooh, there's a leaflet. Read leaflet. Zork is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning. In it, you will explore some of the most amazing territory ever seen by mortals. No computer should be without one. Well, there you go. We'll exit. What? Can I quit? Yes. Go back to drive B. And... I'm going to launch Kermit. 
Now this is a communications program, which I can now point to the virtual modem. There we go. Now I have to turn on redirection through Telnet by saying ATS 15 equals one, and that's from the docs, that's not obvious. But I should at this point be able to connect to the TCP server on my Mac, which connects me to the internet. And all we have to do, I believe, is ATD, and then the IP of the Mac that's acting as the bridge. And the port that I set it up on, which is 6400. There we go. We're on frogfind.com. The IMSI is on the web. And there's a bunch of IMSI data from Wikipedia. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. I really enjoy making these more narrowly focused videos on older tech, so if you did enjoy it, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel if you're not already. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I am mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.